and I haven't been able to find anybody. And I believe Brother Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, was the only one that was able to apply this to the understanding that actually the sixth trumpet was still sounding after here. And as you can tell in my writing here, you can see the sixth trumpet sounding. And under the sixth, trum sixth trumpet sounding, the 1843 chart was made. Under the seventh trumpet sounding, we have the 1850 chart made. So I really think that the, seven, the trumpets play a big important role in our history because we know that the sixth and seventh trumpet will be repeating for us. But I've actually on the seventh trumpet, we're recognizing that all the trumpets are to be sound. And I have a quote where Sister White says that trumpet after trumpet will still be sounding. And as we understand that Philadelphia, as you get to the seven churches, you cannot go back. The Lord always goes forward, but history repeats. The same thing with the trumpets. We cannot go back, but he will have to repeat. It's just like will within a will. Very interesting, and as you can tell, the sister wife had her dreams too shortly after William Foy had his in the same year, but just a different month. In her first dream, I have an account here, it says, even after I had entered the building, I this is actually the, uh, the temple, I a fear came over me and a sense of shame that I must humble myself before these people. But I seemed compelled to move forward and was slowly making my way around the pillar in order to face the Lamb. When a trumpet sounded, the temple shook, shouts of triumph arose from the assembled saints, an awful brightness illuminated the building, then all was intense darkness. So we see that even in her dream, a trumpet is sounding, shaking the temple. I don't know if I have my doing with time, but I kind of want to put in there the understanding of the trumpets. I see I have 10 minutes. The Levites were designed by the Lord as a tribe in the midst of whom the sacred ark was to be born. Moses and Aaron marching just in front of the ark and the sons, and there was only two left, Eliezer and Ithamar, of Aaron falling near them, each bearing a trumpet. And we know that there were two trumpets made, correct? They were to receive direction from Moses, which they were to signify to the people by speaking through the trumpets. These trumpets gave special sounds, which the people understood, and they directed their movements accordingly. A special signal was first given by the trumpeteers to call the attention of the people. Then all were to be attentive and obey the certain sound of the trumpets. There was no confusion of sound in the voices of the trumpets. Therefore, there were no excuse for confusion in movements. The head officer of each company gave definition, definite directions in regard to the movements they were required to make, and none who gave the attention were left in ignorance of what they were to do. If any failed to comply with the requirements given by the Lord to Moses and by Moses to the people, they were punished with death. It would be no excuse to plead that they knew not the nature of these requirements, for they would not for they would only prove themselves willing, willingly ignorant and would receive the just punishment for their transgression. If they did not know the will of God concerning them, it was their own fault. They had the same opportunities to obtain the knowledge imparted as others of the people had. Therefore, their sin of not knowing, not understanding was a great in the sight of God as if they had heard and, be, and been transgressed. Going back... We're going to continue now with the vision of William Miller, uh, William Foy, sorry. Behind the angel, I beheld countless millions of bright chariots. They had the appearance of pure gold and were perfectly square. Each chariot had four wings like flaming fire. And while I was beholding, one of the chariots arose upon its wings of fire. And an angel followed after the chariots and the wings of the chariot. And the wings of the angel cried as with one loud voice saying, Holy, holy. I watched the chariot listening to the lovely sound of the wings. I passed towards the earth and there appeared a spirit of rain, white raiment as it were standing upon a mountain. And there was given him a crown of brightness. And he stepped into the chariot with the angel and in a moment he was in this boundless place. Although he shone with great brightness, yet this individual I knew. It was the one referred to by the witness who said, I see the chariot coming. He departed his life in just two weeks after I saw him in vision. He has a little note there um, saying that this was one of the friends that he had that had passed away. I then saw in the midst of the place an innumerable multitude arrayed in white raiment, standing in a perfect square. Who stands in a perfect square? Having crowns of unfading glory upon their heads. 
They were of the size of children 10 years of age. Found that very interesting because number 10 is important to us, isn't it? And they sang a song which the saints and angels could not sing. Which song is that? Song of Moses, right? Song of Moses and the Lamb. Amen. In the midst of this boundless place, there was a river of pure water, and on either side of the river, countless millions of angels stood with crown of brightness upon their heads. And they had in their hands cup like pure gold and were bowing down and partaking of the water of the living, singing with loud and lovely voices and worshiping him whose crowd gave life to this boundless place. Then came one unto me clothed in white, whom I call my guide. He led me to a place like unto a narrow door. The first which I beheld was a mighty angel upon the right hand, having a large book open before him. Also at the left another with the book open before him. My guide then spake to me, saying, They that repent of their sins on the earth are blotted out of the, of the book on the left. And recorded on the right, I then beheld angels ascending and descending to and fro the earth. They bore tidings to the recording angels. My guide now informed me that I might do, saying, Thy spirit must return to yonder world, and thou must reveal those things which thou hast seen, and also warn thy fellow creatures to flee from the wrath to come. I then answered him, saying, How can I return to yonder world? He answered me, I will go with thee and support and help thee to declare these things unto the world. Then I answered the angels, I will go. I then beheld this lower world. It seemed as though the veil which had separated from the boundless place in which I stood was removed, and they had, be had both become as one, and the saints and angels were continually passing from to the earth, from and to the earth. The earth appeared like a calm sea of transparent gold, Above no cloud or sky appeared, but the air was perfectly pure and of silvery brightness. I then heard all the saints, the angels in heaven and on the earth, singing with loud voices. My guide then spread his wings and brought my spirit gently to the earth, then soared away, and immediately I found myself in the body. And now he's going to give us an account that he got very scared, and for three days he did not share the vision. But we're told that a pastor... On the on 6th of February, the pastor from Bloom, Bloomfield Street Church came and requested him to share his vision. And on the 7th, he does so. And this is the church where he actually shared his, his visions. And I'm going to skip over this. And what I want to bring now to you, to view, the interesting part with it is that I've tried to count the three months. For three months, he went out there and he shared his vision. And right on the month of May, when the 1843 chart came out, he actually stopped sharing. He went home, and for three months, he worked to, to bring money for the family. But he had no peace, and he actually went back to work, went back to work and sharing the visions again. And he did it, as we have an account, all the way through 1844. I also want to bring to a point right now, really quick, the prediction that happened during that time, because I think that's very important. We know that in 1818, William Miller came to the understanding that within 25 years, the earth was going to be destroyed. 1843, that's what he was first understanding. But the prediction was not resounded until 1831. So we know that William Miller came with the prediction 1831. In 1838, we have Josiah Lidge that came with the prediction that only gave the year. In August 1st, 1840, he came with another, well, a prediction again, but this time he, he repeats and enlarges. He gives us the, the year, the month, and the day. And then again, we have Samuel Snow. He begins proclaiming his prediction in February of 1844, but he doesn't come to be heard or recognized until the mid Boston, which is July 21, 1844. Some people write it in their 720, so, but we count it to be 721. And this is the first time that actually Samuel Snow urge the revising dating of October 20 to October 22nd, 1844. And so here what we have actually what you see is basically four predictions altogether, but when you look at them closer, it's actually there's only two, and it's actually almost identical. The year first, and then the year, the day, and the month. And I thought that was very interesting to see that because we know that this history will repeat. How will it repeat in our time? I think the Lord is slowly revealing unto us. And I found it very interesting 
with the baptism. Sister I got baptized in 1840, 1841. Her second baptism was in 1846, after she had accepted the Sabbath. But before the reckoning of time came, we know that we have 40 people that accepted the Sabbath through the Sister Preston, which was a seven-day Baptist. So we do have people that actually kept the Sabbath even before the reckoning of time. And I remember there's a quote of Sister White says, that those that had died in the three angels' message and has kept the Sabbath will be resurrected in the special resurrection. So I do believe there will be people from that time. Now, my time is almost up. I wanted it to close. Um, this is actually Shamel Snow, um, for those of you that... that I have not seen him. And this is, the one on the left. He's, yeah, Samuel Snow is on the left, and then um, George Storrs is on the other side. The two of them were basically very much supporters of October 22nd. A finishing thoughts, give me a few minutes here. Just want to share with you this because I think it's important. This is Sister White sharing with us, telling us that basically there is a land for us to possess and encouraging us that we have to possess it. We can possess it through, through God's help. As God has shown me in holy vision the travels of Advent people to the holy city and the rich reward to be given those who wait the return of the Lord from the wedding, it may, it may be my duty to give you a short sketch of what God has revealed to me. The dear saints have got many trials to pass through, but our light affliction, which are but a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things we, which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal." I have tried to bring back a good report. Is she our spy? And a few graves from the heavenly Canaan, for which many would stone me, as the congregation bade stone Caleb and Joshua for their report. But I declare to you, my brethren and sisters in the Lord, it is a goodly land, and we are able to go and possess it. Well able. Well able. The agency of the Holy Spirit is to combine with human effort and all heaven is engaged in the work of preparing the people for to stand in this, these last days. The end is near and we want to keep the future world in view. The burden of my prayer is that the churches may be aroused from their moral stopper, their moral torpor, loss of sensation, and awaken to earnest interest endeavor. Oh, that they could see and understand that in this last conflict, the captain of the Lord's host is leading on the armies of heaven and mingling in the ranks and fighting our battles for us. We shall have apostasy. We expect them. They will go out from us because they were not of us. Every plant which my heavenly father had not planted shall be rooted up. The angel, the mighty angel from heaven is to lighten the earth with his glory while he cries mightily with a loud voice. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Revelation 18, 2. Oh, how I wish the church to arise and shine because the glory of the Lord has risen upon her. What can we not do in God if every human agency is doing its, every, its very utmost? Without me, ye can do nothing. All the world will be on one side or another of the question. The battle of, Ar Baget, the battle of Armageddon will be fought. And that day must find none of us sleeping. Wide awake we must be as wise virgin, having oil in our vessels with our lamps. What is this? What is this? Grace, grace. Remember midnight, midnight cry. The power of the Holy Ghost must be upon us, and the captain of the Lord host will stand at the hand of the angels of heaven to direct the battle. This is the end of my thing. So solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. Vial after vial poured out one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of stupendous interest are right upon us, and these things will be sure indication of the presence of him who has directed in every aggressive movement, who has accompanied the march of his cause through all the ages, and who has graciously pledged himself to be with his people in all conflicts to the end of the world. He will vindicate his truth. He will cause it to triumph. He is ready to supply his faithful ones with motives and power of purpose, inspiring them with hope and courage and valor and increased activity as the time is at hand. And the Lord help us to be ready to partake of that battle.